Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. Uh, if that's totally a new name for you all, which I think it will be for many folks, uh, we invite you to check out the CCAST story map, which um, Christy or Nicole, if one of you could work on dropping that link directly in the chat uh, for new folks, that would be awesome. Um, my name is Matt Graba. I work for the Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program, and I'm the Average Species Coordinator for Arizona and New Mexico. And I'm also the federal director for CCAST. Um, CCAST is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key conservation challenges on things like introduced aquatic species, uh, which is part of what we're here to talk about today. Uh, we launched the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice back in May of 2020, uh, where we host webinars like this, workshops, um, et cetera. If this is new to you and you want more information on CCAST or the Communities of Practice, uh, please feel free to email uh, me or Christy, and we'll drop our email addresses in the chat as well. So speaking of Christy, um, I'll go ahead and pass the microphone off to her, and we'll get on with the presentation. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Christy Miner. I am the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAST. One way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange is through webinars like this one. We're very excited to host a presentation today from Tim Gatewood and Zachary Jackson, who will discuss the recovery of Apache trout in the White Mountains of Arizona. Tim is the fisheries ma program manager for the White Mountain Apache Tribe Game and Fish Department and has been leading Apache trout recovery efforts on behalf of the tribe for about the past 20 years. Zach is the project coordinator for the Arizona Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office in White River, where he has led implementation of Apache trout recovery actions for the US Fish and Wildlife Service for the past five years. Before that, Zach worked on salmon and sturgeon research, monitoring and habitat restoration projects in California for 10 years with the US Fish and Wildlife Service Lodi Fish and Wildlife Office. So just one final reminder before I turn it over to our presenters. If you have any questions during the presentation, please just enter them into the chat box uh, during the presentation and I will relay them to the speakers after the presentation is finished. And with that, uh, Zach, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Matt asked Tim and I to talk about recovery of Apache trout in the White Mountains of Arizona. We'll start the talk with me covering information from the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox case study of Apache trout. After we cover information from the case study and some recent accomplishments, will respond to a few topics that Matt thought might be of interest to this group. And then I'll probably subject, uh, <clears throat> subject you to some slides we have about our intensified mechanical removal technique. This last part is information that I presented at, the, at last month's Gila River Basin Native Fishes Conservation Program meeting. So some of you may have heard this last part before and wish to save yourselves from hearing it again. However, if you hang on to the bitter end, you'll get to hear a little bit about the greatest college football program of all time and be informed about their next scheduled win so that you can start making arrangements now to witness this historic event. <clears throat> Tim is just now hearing about this exciting addition to our presentation and uh, he looks pleased. All right. Um, the Apache trout is found only in the waters of the White Mountains in Eastern Arizona. In 1955, the White Mountain Apache tribe was the first group to recognize declines in Apache trout populations, implement policy, and work toward Apache trout conservation <clears throat> by closing its habitat to fishing on their lands, among other actions. The Apache trout was better listed as endangered in 1967 then downlisted to threatened in 1975 due to the discovery of additional populations, successful captive culturing, removal of overexploitation as a threat, and reduction of logging and hybridization as threats. Currently, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and White Mountain Apache Tribe Game and Fish Department 
are working with the Arizona Game and Fish Department and the U.S. Forest Service to recover Apache trout populations through non-native species management, stream restoration, reintroduction, and captive fish production and stocking. The decline of Apache trout was caused by overexploitation, introduction of non-native trout species, and watershed degradation. Logging, reservoir and road construction, mining, and agriculture reduced and damaged habitat. Introduced brown trout and brook trout prey on Apache trout, posing a direct threat to individuals and populations. These species also compete for food resources and habitat. Introduced rainbow trout and cutthroat trout can interbreed with native Apache trout, creating hybrids that are no longer representative of the natural genetic diversity of Apache trout. As with all listed species protected by the Endangered Species Act, the, the primary goal is to recover and delist them. In the case of Apache trout, the goal is to do so after establishing three sustaining populations of genetically pure Apache trout. Other central and related goals are to establish and maintain barriers to keep invasive fish away from recovery populations, sustain separate populations for recovery and recreational sport fishing, and continue to monitor populations of pure Apache trout. We'll now switch gears from goals to the recovery effort uh, of the recovery effort to mentioning some of the projects we've been working on. We'll cover non-native trout eradication efforts here, then barriers for non-native trout management and stocking on subsequent slides. When dealing with non-native trout, the options often come down to implementing either chemical or mechanical eradication projects. Chemical treatment has been used to kill all fish in re Apache trout recovery streams, and chemical treatments are typically uh, more successful, faster, and can be completed with less effort and cost than mechanical eradication projects. However, they do tend to raise greater public concerns. The last chemical treatments for Apache trout recovery were conducted in the West Fork and South Fork Little Colorado River recovery streams in 2008. Chemical treatment is currently being planned for the West Fork Black River system. Some land management agencies don't allow chemical treatments on their land and waters, or at least uh, in certain streams. In these cases, mechanical removal is necessary. <clears throat> mechanical removal using electrofishing techniques and then netting the fish and removing them can take years or even decades of effort, and the overall effectiveness is less certain than with chemical treatments. However, several mechanical removal projects have been successfully completed recently, several are ongoing, and several others are in planning stages. Although mechanical removal requires greater funding and consistently dedicated high levels of effort, it tends to cause much less concern among the public, and it can be effective. I'll talk more about efforts we've already implemented to improve the speed and effectiveness of mechanical removal efforts later on during the presentation. Barriers, including natural waterfalls and constructed drop structures are used to keep non-native trout species separate from upstream recovery habitats of Apache trout. There are currently 26 pure populations of Apache trout protected by natural or artificial barriers, 18 of which are free of non-native trout. We will, um, and we continue to work towards protecting all pure populations of Apache trout with functional barriers and to liberate Apache trout recovery populations from the deleterious effects of non-native trout. We're planning to construct a new barrier on Big Benito Creek during 2022 and we have funding for new barriers on Flash and Squaw Creeks, and we're working to finalize designs for those projects now. We also recently received proposals for designing seven additional barriers on Apache trout recovery streams, and we'll begin fundraising for those projects this year.
We stock Apache trout for both reintroduction purposes and supporting sport fishing. When reintroducing Apache trout following a chemical renovation or wildfire, we typically collect fish from established wild populations. Apache trout raised at the Williams Creek National Fish Hatchery or Arizona State Hatcheries are stocked in selected locations for sport fishing, although they have been used for reintroduction purposes as well. We've learned a few lessons throughout the Apache trout recovery effort. Barriers must be built tall enough to prevent passage of non-native fish during high flow events. Some early barrier designs were not adequate to block upstream passage during all stream flow conditions. Concrete barriers are preferable to gabion structures, which are wire baskets filled with rocks, um, because they're less likely to fail and have a much longer effective lifespan. All the barriers that we're planning to construct here uh, in the near future are of the concrete um, sort of 50 year design life um, approach. Runoff events following catastrophic wildfires in particular can result in large sediment flows that have compromised fish barriers. Mechanical removal is pretty difficult and streams need to be weightable to allow complete removal of non-native fish. So we're talking smaller, narrower, shallower streams. Mechanical removal must be done annually as part of an ongoing management plan or the reproductive potential of non-native trout can quickly outgain removal efforts. Chemical removal is more likely to be successful, but public concern can be an impediment to this approach. Um, so we're, we're planning to use both chemical and, and mechanical approaches um, as appropriate for the recovery stream we're working on. Partnerships really have been essential in the recovery of Apache trout. This collaboration has allowed for increased and shared funding and has resulted in larger teams working on recovery efforts, including non-native trout removal projects. Here I've listed the next steps we identified during the CCAST project. Complete a species status assessment and subsequent five-year status review to update our biological understanding of the species and forecast future trends for the populations. The SSA core team began work during late 2019 and completed the species status assessment in September of 2021. And we're already working on a revision to this document uh, so that it'll be inclusive of all 2021 field work. We'll continue to update it into the future. Work on a five-year status review has not begun. The SSA core team completed the Apache Trout Cooperative Management Plan during 2021. This historic document describes that recovery partners understand that Apache trout are a conservation reliance species and outlines the management actions and step-down activities needed to achieve and maintain recovery and provide for long-term management. Finally, we've continued working to eradicate non-native species from key streams, including the West Fork Black River and Bear Wallow Creek projects. We'll also need to eradicate brown trout from about 20 miles of habitat within the Big Benito Creek system after we complete construction of the new barrier. And we have completed eradication of brown trout in Crooked, Flash, and Paradise Creeks and expect to complete additional projects that are currently underway. We're now going to transition away from the CCAST case study format of the talk and address some of the topics that Matt thought uh, might be of interest to this group. White Mountain Apache Tribe Game and Fish Department and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have a long history of close coordination and working together for mutual benefit on both conservation and sport fish projects. What makes this work? Both groups are willing to commit the blood, sweat, and tears needed to accomplish both types of projects. Our conservation office and hatcheries are located on the reservation, and that proximity probably helps with maintaining a strong relationship. 
We work together on improving Apache trout broodstock genetics management, hatchery trout production, and trout stocking, as well as catfish stocking from a Texas hatchery. We've also committed to providing volunteer and employment opportunities for tribal youth to experience and make meaningful contributions to conservation projects close to home and hopefully pursue a career in natural resources management. Matt thought folks might be interested in hearing our thoughts on how we're able to sustain funding for Apache trout recovery work. Because of the White Mountain Apache tribe's early conservation work, our committed and productive relationship, interest in Apache trout as a sport fish and conservation story, and our conservation successes to date, it's not hard to put together an aspiring vision of what is achievable in the near future. And funders have been buying what we're selling. However, despite the status of Apache trout as a sport fish, neither the tribe nor US Fish and Wildlife Service is eligible for wildlife and sport fish restoration funding. Whisper funding by law goes to states. Arizona Game and Fish Department does receive some WISPR funding that supports a portion of their Apache trout recovery work. As for projects that Tim and I work most closely on, we've been getting more aggressive in developing project ideas, pursuing funding, hiring. We've hired over 60 seasonal staff during the last four seasons alone, and deploying resources to both spend projects out and do at least as much as we said we would. We approach proposals with the mindset of underperforming or underpromising <laughs> and over delivering. Some of you know um, that I talk a big game and we follow through. It takes a lot of, and it takes a lot of we to follow through. Um, creativity and flexibility is key at our levels and among our leadership. And finally, funders tell you what they want to see in proposals. Proposing what they're looking for seems to work pretty well for us. We were also asked if human dimensions were a key part of the project, particularly regarding non-native trout removal. Now, we don't face public resistance to our non-native uh, trout removal projects like our partners working outside the reservation do, because angling is not allowed where we're conducting this work. But we do hear from anglers, and it's Tim that's on the front lines when the public has thoughts to share about fisheries management issues. <clears throat> there are some areas where we've had uh, anglers express displeasure about return to creel of Apache trout in lakes, and we've faced pressures to provide non-native species that might return to creel better in benthic settings upstream of recovery habitat. We have addressed those concerns by investigating survival rates and adjusting stocking rates and sizes in one particular case. But more generally, we provide diverse fishing opportunities to satisfy both the anglers that are willing to work a little harder to have the opportunity to catch a prized native Apache trout in lakes and streams in proximity to recovery habitats, as well as those that just wanna catch any trout by stocking rainbow, brown, and brook trouts in lakes adequately separated from recovery habitats. Tim asked that I present this slide, but he is here with me and happy to take questions on this and other topics at the end of the presentation. The White Mountain Apache tribe initially recognized the Apache trout population declines and enacted initial uh, protections to preserve and restore Apache trout. The tribe developed a relationship with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service over the decades since and formalized operational guidelines for government-to-government -government discourse in our statement of relationship. Our mutual interests and the trust we've developed working together over the years has allowed us to accomplish much together that we wouldn't have been able to working alone. Developing two hatcheries, the Apache trout broodstock, a world-class Apache trout sport fishing, broodstock genetic management, and many, many recovery actions. 
We're also working together with other with the other Apache Trout recovery partners, such as with the, uh, the recently finalized Apache Trout Cooperative Management Plan. To this day and into the foreseeable future, the tribe remains committed to protecting Apache Trout, regardless of the federal listing status. Now transition to sharing some preliminary information about our intensified non-native removal technique um, that we first implemented during 2021. I'm calling our newly developed and tested technique the overwhelming violence of action approach for non-native trout removal. Brook trout in the case of the project I'll be discussing here. The project, which I'll only be able to briefly discuss today, was, was born out of dissatisfaction with the results we were ending our seasons on after completing five or more non-native trout removal passes through a stream. What we were doing then was typically starting at the downstream extent of a population at a barrier or um, on some populations at the reservation boundary and just doing a single electrofishing pass from there up until the headwaters. So some of the, like for, for an example of what we didn't think was working very well, we went through the entire Fort Apache section of Upper West Fork Black River five times during 2019 and caught 1,502, then 1,367, then 1,351, then 1,111, and finally 821 brook trout. I felt we needed something much more intense. So this is what Tim and I came up with. What characterizes the OVA approach? It's pretty simple. We place block nets at the lower and upper bounds of 100 meter reaches, and then go through the site again and again until we don't catch any more brook trout. Captured native fish are held in aerated buckets along the stream, in in-stream pens or cribs in the next reach upstream, or released in the adjacent downstream reach while depletion passes continue. And captured brook trout are used to support riparian vegetation regeneration. Discrete passes through a site are called depletion passes, and there might be three, or there could be 19 whatever it takes to get um, a zero pass on brook trout. Whereas all stream sites together represent an eradication pass. Then we go back downstream to the starting point, the reservation boundary in this case, and repeat the entire process on the second eradication pass, and so on. We completed six eradication passes on Thompson Creek during 2021, made up of 281 depletion passes. It took 582 staff days to accomplish this and more than a half million seconds of electrofishing effort. Similarly, we completed 280 passes through West Fork Black River sites, but because that stream is so much larger, we did not complete the first eradication pass. We did complete depletion passes at about half of the sites on that stream, and we deployed 342 staff days and nearly a half million seconds of electrofishing effort to do it. And a little tidbit for any audience members of the contracting persuasion, we were funded to put 676 days of effort into this project during 2021. So as usual, we gave this project our typical 136.7% effort. So what did we accomplish? We removed over 8,000 brook trout from both streams, over 5,000 from about half of the West Fork Black River sites on the first eradication pass. And this really highlights the amount of work available for the doing in this stream. I'm going to focus on Thompson Creek for a few reasons, but primarily because we got very near to eradication in this stream in a single field season. I think that is probably the single most important take home you can complete a mechanical eradication project in a single season. We almost did it on our first try, and with a couple of tweaks, I'm confident that we could have. 
we can take what we learned here and better plan and execute future projects. The other important take home for me is that we found that some capture probabilities were significantly lower than we expected, particularly in West Fork Black River. We expected our capture probabilities to be similar to what we found in the literature and generally pretty high. Here I'm showing calculated capture probabilities from a brook trout removal project in Utah, where they found CPs for age zero brook trout to be around 0.48 and age one plus CPs to be around 0.84. We broke down our capture probability data a little differently into basically juvenile, sub-adult, and adult size categories. Our less than 100 millimeter category probably includes both age zero and age one fish for reference to the expected results. Our juvenile CP in Thompson Creek was around 0.65 and around 0.31 in West Fork Black River. About half the CP in Thompson Creek and in general capture probabilities in Thompson Creek were about double those in West Fork Black River. Perhaps our biggest surprise was how low our CPs were for fish over 130 millimeters. 0.73 and 0.4342, much below the 0.84 observed in the Utah work that included smaller sizes. We plan to dig into these data a lot more and we'll share that information in the future. Some of the details we hope to explore include capture probability by site, month, stream flow, and electrofishing voltage. And we'll use these data explorations to better project what is needed to accomplish mechanical removal in this and future projects. I'm going to spend my last minute or two mentioning what I see as the larger challenges and considerations for this type of work. Capture probability increased when we increased voltage in late June to match ambient conductivity based voltage goals. Measured conductivity was usually in the teens to low 30s, and those conductivities really aren't fished well with voltages below 600. Capture probability also predictably decreased in July and August when stream flows increased drastically. We feel that using block nets was critical to our success on the Thompson Creek removal and to the progress we made on West Fork Black River. However, we really had persistent issues keeping block nets functioning during high flow periods. These factors certainly led to the much higher than expected number of depletion passes required, as well as the suboptimal capture probabilities. Now, we thought we had designed our sight lengths to be short enough for us, us to finish them in a single day. However, we were unable to complete most sites in a single day during the first eradication pass on either stream, and still some sites weren't finished in a day during the second and third eradication passes on Thompson Creek. This isn't really surprising given the high densities of brook trout observed, lower than anticipated capture probabilities, and the issues we faced keeping block nets functioning. Oops. But better isolating, um, better isolating our Better isolating our depletion sites would allow us to reduce the number of depletion passes through a site and complete sites within a day. Finally, we're convinced that using portable barriers would greatly increase the effectiveness of mechanical removal efforts in these and similar systems. And we're hoping to at least deploy a barrier at the reservation boundary next year on each stream to keep fish from moving across the boundary in either direction. We'll continue to look for better methods to isolate our discrete depletion sites while we're working and otherwise implement changes so that we can complete sites within one workday. Now I'm not gonna dwell on this, but North Dakota State University did just win another national championship. And I know there's at least one person on the line really interested in this information. And for all you Arizona fans out there, the Bison have already got their next win. It's September of this year. You know, go ahead and start planning now to witness this historic event. 
I'll, I'll get back up to something more uh, go here and uh, stop presenting. Happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you, Zach. That was an excellent presentation. Um, lots of inf interesting information. Um, we've got a few questions for, for either one of you. Um, the first question we have here is a clarifying question. It says, just to clarify, you receive funding for Apache trout as a conservation species, but not as much funding for sport fishing or sport fishing restoration? Um, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has obligations to work with tribes for, um, you know, both on conservation projects and to support sport fishing. So some internal funding is certainly um, applied to sport fishing efforts, but we don't um, seek or receive any sort of additional outside funding for our sport fishing work with the tribe. The hatcheries are supported by, you know, which, which do a lot of the work for raising and stocking out fish and supporting sport fishing. And those are supported with internal Fish and Wildlife Service funds. Um, the funding we talk about going after, that's for um, Apache trout recovery projects. Awesome. All right, our next question. Um, can you expand on the governance structures for maximizing the project success? i.e. how they formalize or not their par partnerships and what observations you've made that would be a must have. Another way to ask this is what do you recommend for new groups wanting to work together? Um, I recommend, so, you know, the, the development of the relationship between the, the tribe and the Fish and Wildlife Service and all the recovery partners is, is a very, very long-term one. Um, for new groups working to establish a, a new program, I mean, I think all I can personally recommend is that you can't put too much effort into building you know, building and maintaining relationships. Um, and that's an ongoing process. And for that to go well, you know, you need to, you need to do what you say you're gonna do. You need to, you know, be truthful and, and, uh, and forthright and follow through. I think um, those are critical aspects. Tim, did you wanna add? I think uh, a lot of what we rely on is to trust other agencies and this trusting us and you know building that good relation and keeping that going. Like uh, Zach saying, you know, if you're gonna do something, you know, come up, run, and, you know, run with it after that. Awesome. I think that's all great, great advice. Okay, um, another question. What other native fish were found in your removal streams? Um, speckled dace and desert sucker. Awesome. And do you remove other non-native or invasive species during the depletion and eradication passes? Um, no, we don't. Um, we only encounter brook trout and brown trout during our Apache trout. Those are the only fish species we encounter that are non-natives during our Apache trout recovery work. Um, and the other non-native species, you know, would belong to, you know, there's, there are crayfish, there are um, some aquatic plants, um, but, but we really just remove the non-native trout from recovery habitat. Okay, awesome. 
Um, the next question, if Tim is willing, um, we'd love to hear a bit about the importance of Apache trout for the White Mountain Apache tribe and considerations for non-native species. Also a request to not talk about Arizona football. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that case, we'll talk about Arizona basketball. <laughs> but uh, we are, uh, uh, for the tribe, their perspectives on Apache trout is, uh, I guess we've always uh, cared for that and cared for other resources, but, you know, I feel like uh, tribe's happy where we're going now. I feel like we're moving forward and, you know, we picked up the pace in the past uh, few years and it's looking good. The tribe likes it and tribe members are pr you know, proud of that fish because it's named the pet shrub for them. So we uh, continue to protect that and we'll always protect uh, where they're at in the headwaters. And that's why those hatcheries are important to us. It uh, takes, uh, you know, we offer sport fishing, but that hatcheries help us provide that. We don't uh, allow fishing on our headwaters. So we'll continue to, uh, to uh, push for that, to have them uh, here for forever. And that's, I guess that's our stance. We, uh, we're, uh, We'll always uh, protect them, and just not that, but other resources around that, around the reservation. Awesome. And if anyone, um, while we're going through these questions, if anyone has follow-up questions um, or any additional questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, we've got a couple more left as of right now. Um, can you describe the portable barriers? How long are they meant to function in variable stream flows and how much do they cost? So the capture probability data that I included from the Utah project, um, that work's been published and uh, they called it a permeable barrier in that, that project. That's what I'm referring to. That's the design. Um, that we're looking to have built and install next year. Um, the cost is, you know, totally dependent upon the materials you use and given rapidly changing uh, materials prices, you know, I don't know uh, that I can very accurately answer that question, but I can tell you that um, we're looking at buying an aluminum version of that um, so that we can, break it down and hike it in and, and set it up on site. Um, and we're expecting that to cost between eight and $9,000 for a single unit. Um, I believe during the Utah project, they had one of these out for three years, but I wouldn't quote me on that. Uh, we certainly think that we can deploy them and keep them out for several years, uh, which we think is going to be long enough in most cases to get done what we want to. And then um, my expectation is that we'll be able to continue, that they'll be dur durable enough to continue to use them for many years on many projects. Great. That's is there anything awesome. I, I overlooked in that question? <laughs> Let me see here. Um, do you know anything about how they work in variable stream flows? I think that's the only part I'm not sure of. So um, the basic approach is, you know, that they're, that there's, they've got a mouth and, you know, uh, a downstream kind of approach. Um, and that's got to be sized to the stream, and that might take some sandbags or something uh, if your stream's a bit wider. So anytime your stream would go over bank, uh, I'm sure you'd lose effectiveness with it. Um, but you could also, if you know that that's going to be a case, you could also be prepared for that uh, with sandbagging or, or some sort of other device um, to direct flow over the barrier. 
And these barriers, basically, if a fish from downstream is um, moving upstream, what they end up doing is going under the barrier and getting blocked. And then any fish from upstream that are moving in a downstream direction um, could get stranded on the barrier. It's an incli inclined plane uh, barrier with a bunch of holes in it that'll drain out. So I can't give sort of like stream size and flow numbers, but you know, just kind of generally describe what would be problematic for the barriers. Awesome, I think that's really helpful. All right, um, have you considered the experimental use of YY male brook trout stocking in combination with your mechanical removal? It could be useful where pure mechanical removal is difficult. We have considered it, but we haven't we haven't yet pursued it. Um, the place where, you know, it probably would be Thompson Creek and West Fork Black River, where Tim and I have talked about using that approach. Um, you know, that approach takes time and it still takes a lot of effort and mechanical removal um, to reduce the population size and, and to keep pulling out unmarked fish. Um, so we're, we're actually hoping um, to work to pair a chemical renovation with um, Arizona Game and Fish Department on the lower parts of the system. Uh, so we're working through that process now. In the meantime, though, you know, we want to give the Apache trout that are in that, in those systems, um, a break, um, reduce the numbers of brook trout and suppress them so that even if we do have to go with a chemical renovation to complete the project, it's going to be that much more likely to be successful. And if we're not able to get approval for chemical renovation, um, we're keeping the pressure on those brook trout so that um, it remains a manageable situation. Awesome. Um, next question is, if you took the time, money, and effort invested in mechanical removal and put it into a well-funded and designed campaign to get public agency support for rote known use, would that lead to cheaper and faster recovery in the long run? Um, not on the reservation. I mean, <clears throat> I don't, I don't think so. You know, I think, um, chemical renovations used to occur on the reservation and, um, you know, several tribal councils ago, they decided they wanted to move away from that, that approach. Um, and we've now done a ton of work and demonstrated that we can do mechanical renovation and make it work. Um, but our feeling is that given the amount of work yet to do and how long it takes, um, we, we don't wanna be patient enough to complete all the projects through mechanical renovation. Um, and we don't think that we're likely to continue to get the level of funding that we need um, for all of those projects. So we're re-engaging with the council and other groups with the tribe um, to see if we can get support for using chemical renovation techniques on the reservation again. But for Arizona Game and Fish Department and our other recovery partners like the Forest Service, um, you know, that question is, might be better posed. Got it. Thank you. Um, all right, another question. During brook, kraut, uh, brook trout removal passes, have there been any efforts in redirecting stream flow to deplete water and to help increase catch probability? No. Uh, an interesting idea that I have not considered. Yeah. Awesome. Um, those are all the questions I've seen in the chat. Um, we have a few minutes, so if 
people have more questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. I think at this point, um, you could probably unmute yourself and ask as well if you're comfortable, um, but either way is fine. All right, we have a request in the chat. Um, can you can you point me towards the Utah removal paper with the about the portable barrier? Is there any way you can maybe share the title or something? Yeah, I sure can. Uh, it's Thompson and McKell. It was published in twenty one, and I think it's North American Journal of Fisheries Management. But I might even be able to. Figure out how to put it in the chat. Yeah, that would be great if you can. I'm not sure if that's an option, but. <laughs> Me either. I know they're always changing it. Um, another similar, uh, sort of similar question. Um, can you provide a link to the most recent reports on the overall recovery effort? The, that sounds like the species status assessment to me. Um, and we don't have that posted yet, but it should not be long. And the plan is to um, distribute that pretty widely as well as post it. Okay, awesome. Um, another question we have are, do you have any concerns about the crayfish you found? Yes, but um, not relative to, um, you know, replacing barriers and removing non-native trout. Got it. Other questions? I'm also going to put a link. Um, to the case study that was written up about this. This also has contact information and such. There's that. All right, and one last call for any additional questions. I, I am trying, it, it looks like it's gonna work, but it, my connection is slow enough that it's taking forever to upload. Um, but okay. the paper is going to be in the chat soon. All right. Give it a minute and hope that it uploads. All right. And what I'll do is um, I'll go ahead and close us out, um, but I won't end the call right away. Um, just so that those who are interested in that link can make sure to get it. Go Bison. <laughs> All right, so thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, as you know, the webinar is being recorded and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel uh, where you can also find all of our previous webinars. Uh, we'll try to have that up by the end of the week. Um, also encourage you to visit CCAST and our case study dashboard where we currently have 129 case studies and should be several more in the next couple months. Um, and maybe I'll see if uh, Matt or Nicole, if one of you can share some of those links. Um, also wanted to uh, announce that next month, our next webinar uh, will be on February 15th. We'll be hosting a webinar by Matt Morrison from the Ministry of Forest in British Columbia on American bullfrog control along the US-Canada border, building on previous webinars and workshops that CCAST has hosted on bullfrogs. 
We're also working on lining up other webinar speakers for the coming months. So please contact us if you would like to receive webinar announcements but aren't yet on our mailing list. So thank you all for your time. And thank you again, Zach and Tim, for joining us to give this excellent presentation. We hope everyone has a good day.